Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the legend Teddy Atlas. And today, Teddy's got a special guest, Spencer Brown, joining us, uh, manager of Tyson Fury. How you doing, boys? How are you? Manager of Tyson Fury, the heavyweight champ of the world. And um, Spencer is with us from London. Is it London or is, I know it's somewhere across the pond. Where are you? I'm up in the north. Uh, I'm up in the north. Uh, just outside of a place called Blackpool. Uh, okay. It's near Manchester, very close to Manchester. Well, I'm glad you were able to get uh, Zoom in those woods over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're doing better than I would have done. I I never would have been able to uh, connect us that way. I am a complete caveman when it comes to that. Uh, I'm not far away from you, uh, Teddy, when it comes to that, to be honest. Listen, Spencer, it's great to have you on. Um, obviously, your fighter and your friend uh, Tyson Fury, he has a big event coming up uh, against Nganu, yes. the former UFC heavyweight champ of the world in, over in Saudi Arabia. That's coming up at the end of October. I think it's October 28th. Am I right with that date? I believe so. You're right, Teddy. I mean, it's a shame he, he, he wanted to be on here today, but he's just uh, welcomed the birth of his seventh child, a little boy who is called Rico, um, after uh, after one of his uh, after one of his relations that unfortunately died not so long back. So it's it's a very poignant day for him, and it's um, it's just likely to tell you that he is going to come back on the show. Can't wait to speak to you, you and Ken, and um, it will be in the near future. Well, I appreciate that, Tom. Congratulations on the um the new baby boy i i had to laugh spencer when you said little boy is, does he have anything <laughs> little <laughs> uh, I, I mean how big no, is he <laughs> now if he was on the program now there'd be a, there'd be he'd be saying something else but uh yeah. he's got seven kids uh, none of them are little they're all monsters uh, his 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 uh, in-laws are monsters his nieces and nephews they're, they're all big kids they're all and they, everybody in the family can fight. Whether it's the dad, wow. the son, the nephew, everybody can fight. Wow. You know, his brothers can fight. He, you know, they've all got a history in boxing. His brother was a good pro. He's, uh, you know, he could have he could have done very well at the game. Uh, he's got another brother who turned it in very early. Uh, went doing what he done, but he's a huge guy. Again, six foot eight, six nine, twenty five stone. A monster. Everyone, everybody, big John can fight. They can all fight. If you're not a fury, you are a fury. You've got to be out of fight. Yeah, that's part of the deal. That's part of the 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 family tradition and uh, history. I well, congratulations to him from all of us and the fans, everybody on having thank God a healthy baby boy. And that's seven for him now. That's three boys and four girls. Does that mean that he's got to go for at least one more to even up the, I, I the size? I don't think uh I think um Paris would would like another three. <laughs> Good luck to her. And I think Tyson would just like to keep going. He's a great I mean he's a fantastic father. If you've seen him with his kids, he's unbelievable. He's got a great personality. Spence, we have seen him on on Tyson's reality show on Netflix. I feel like I know him like one of my uh, cousins. <laughs> he's a maniac it? just like the rest of Oh, he's crazy. He reminds me of growing up in Boston in the uh, inner city. He's a nut. <laughs> his behavior is crazy. It's, it's so entertaining. He, he has bipolar. <laughs> so one morning you might walk around and say, I've got some deals here for you. You get, you get sent out the door. We're not even a hello or goodbye. Other days it's come in and you'll be with him the whole day. No, one day is never the same. The fact that he speaks about the bipolar disorder is what makes it okay to watch because at times, to your point, if you didn't know that, you'd be like, what the hell? This guy's moods are all over the place. He's up, yeah. then he's down, he's happy, then he's sad. But yeah, it's uh, it's it's incredibly interesting. It was a great watch and we, we just had numerous, numerous people who were saying to us, I watched all eight series at one time. I could not stop watching it. It was unbelievable. <laughs> it just, you know, and 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 some of the things you, you see in it is th this is not put on by the way. This is this oh, is you not can put tell. On. I can tell it's sincere. It, it it's real life and it's 
it's what they encounter daily. My daughter loves it. My daughter, Nicole, who you've talked to, Spencer. She, yeah, um, lovely girl. Thank you. Yeah, her and my son, they both talk about it. They say that he, how can you not like the guy? You know, he's got that kind of personality that uh, it gets your attention. But at the end of the day, you walk away saying, you know what? He's he's a decent, nice, crazy person maybe, but a decent person, a, a lovable person, if you want to say it. A big teddy bear. Maybe that's a better description of it. I, I think you've hit the nail on the head exactly what he is. He's, he's not got a violent bone in his body. No. I've never seen him attack, um, be nasty, be, be any of those kind of things that you wouldn't like in a human being. I've never seen him be like that to anybody. He's not interested. Outside the ring, a, a big teddy bear. Inside, it's a different map. He's got a great, great, great story. And I've said it's it on incredible. this day, I've said it on ESPN, that it's a great story for everyone. You know, it's a, it's a story of redemption. You know, it's a story of choosing life over death, quite frankly. You know, and... It's a story of pulling yourself by the bootstraps uh, up and deciding that hey, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna live life, you know, I'm I'm gonna get out of this place that I am, this this terrible dungeon, if you will, um, yeah. that I've been trapped in with with drugs and alcohol and depression, and I'm gonna you know I'm gonna. I'm going to change my life. And he did. And he became heavyweight champ of the world. And for me, it all started with that moment when he was on the floor with the hardest puncher in boxing, Deontay Wilder. And it seemed like an eternity. I, I, I can only tell you what it seemed like to me. I'm sure to you it probably was the same. But it seemed like time had stopped. It just seemed yeah. like time had frozen. And he was there forever. And obviously it was nine seconds or eight seconds. And for me... I said this, I talked about this in detail, where I felt like he was thinking. He His whole life was passing by him in those eight seconds, and he was thinking, am I going to live or am I going to stay down here? I'm, and then within eight seconds, he said, I'm going to live. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up, I'm going to rise up, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live. He, it's like he was thinking about, do I go on or do I stop here? And he went on. And then, of course, uh, the rest is history, as they say, because that was the morning of a great story, a, a great story. And, and I'll, I'll leave it to you to elaborate on that. And if I'm close to being correct in a way that I felt when I watched that. But the other thing is, he's been a great teacher for all of us to just never give up. That no matter what you've been through, no matter how bad life can look, don't give up. Because when you give up, there is no light. But if you don't give up, there's always a chance to get back to the light. And for me, when he rose up, that's what he was doing. He was getting back to the light. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, whoever whoever gets to make the film of, of, of Tyson Fury, it's going to be some film. We're, we're, we're not, we've got to not forget as well that before this happened, he was he bloomed to 28 stone. He, you know, everything in his life has fallen apart. He'd become an alcoholic. Drugs were involved, all sorts. I mean, you name it, he, he hit rock bottom. Well, he was very honest about it. He even said that he had suicidal thoughts. He, he has a, a very good friend called Dave. Um, and, and his father and his brothers, which they were a very strong family unit, uh, and, and they all got together and, and pulled him out of this. We've got to give a mention to his ex-trainer, Ben Davidson, who helped him with all his, you know, get all his weight off, and he lived with him until, he, until it was off and, you know, and, and became like a brother to him, really. Um, it, it's a story that can own, it's a Hollywood blockbuster. That's all I can say. It's a Hollywood blockbuster that, you know, will be told one day. I agree. And the, and like I said, the bonus to that, not that you need a bonus. I mean, that story speaks for itself. But the bonus to that is he is he is a teaching lesson to all of us in, in some ways that you don't give yeah. up. You know, you don't you just don't turn the lights out on life. 
You don't turn the lights out on life. And um, and and thankfully, you know, for everybody has enjoyed him in the sport, and of course his family and all the people that care about him. Thankfully that uh, he he made that decision to continue with life. So I know that I know that you want to talk about the Enganyu. Why don't you talk a little bit about the Enganyu fight first? And then I know you have something else that's kind of big out there, real big. Matter of fact, it's um, it's consistent with the Furies. Everything they do is big. Um, you know, we just talked about that. He had another son. I could only imagine how big he is. He's probably over ten pounds, uh, maybe even more. <laughs> but I think, yeah, about, I think he bites in his tongue a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that. Let's talk about Nganyu. Nganyu, the former heavyweight champ. Uh, I work with him in the gym. I know how athletic he is. I know how fast he is. I know how much he can punch. And I'm not trying to sell nothing here, but I'm going to say before I give it to you, this guy's dangerous. I know he's not a boxer. I get it. I, I know he's not going to become, you know, a, a, a boxer in a couple months, but he's an athlete. He was a striker in MMA. He's a professional fighter. He knows how to deal with with those realms, those realms of pressure, those realms of fear, those realms of consequence, um, those realms of danger. He knows how to be calm in an uncalm environment. Um, and he's got confidence. And, you know, he's got opportunity. Those, are, those can all be dangerous mixes. When you're a heavyweight champ of the world and you're going in there in an event, a crossover event, but it's to fight this guy, and no matter what, you could call it exhibition, you could call it whatever it is, it's 10 rounds, but the, it's, it's real, when the, when the bell rings, it's real, and those punches are real, and as I've said many times, Nganyu has one thing that can erase many, many mistakes, very Many shortcomings, many sins, if you will. If you were Catholic, you believe in going to confession to get rid of the sins. Well, there's one thing is the confessional booth, and that's power. Punches are born, they're not made. One thing in Ganyu has, he's got power. And that that a great eraser, as I said a minute ago, can make up for a lot of shortcomings in one quick instant. Uh, yes, he's got to learn how to deliver that punch. I get it. Yes, he's in there with the best technical boxer probably uh, in the world right now as far as heavyweights go. Um, he's, I, I guess Usyk is, is close to there, but I would, I would make Tyson even above because Tyson can go get you, which he proved uh, when we hadn't seen that, but he proved that in the fight he had to come from behind him when he was cut very badly. And then he did it, of course, with Wilder in the second fight where he went after him. And then he can box. You know, he, he, can, he can do everything that you need to do in that ring. Is he taking the Nganyu fight seriously? Because I'll tell you the truth. If he's not, he might have a problem. I, I, again, not trying to build nothing up. Uh, I'm just speaking as I always do, from my experience and my judgment. I, I totally agree with what you just said. I don't think that Tyson is taking any, any, this, not seriously, this is a very, very serious fight for him. He's got everything to lose. Everything. Not just, uh, forget the money, if he, he, he can walk down the street ever again if he doesn't, if he doesn't put this guy away. Don't forget what I just heard from you there. We've been hearing, just not from you, but from a lot of other people. This guy's got a huge punch. He's powerful. He's athletic. And he's big. He's a big guy. We talk about Tyson, how big he is. This guy's he's a big. Monster. He's a monster, but so is Tyson. But I'm telling you, he is not leaving no stone unturned. He's in the, yesterday. He had to birth his kid. He was there for nine hours. He went straight from there, straight to the gym. And trained. He's in there twice. They are taking. They're taking this very, very seriously. And and why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you take this seriously? After what you just said, Spencer. You know uh, that if anything, I have a reputation. Me and Ken have a reputation of. We're going to say it straight. And yeah. And um. And 
you know, I, I think that everyone should do that, but not everyone does. But we're going to say it straight. How do you reconcile, having said what you just said, with, I don't know how long ago it was, but it wasn't that long ago, there was a, a press conference and there was photos, there was video of Tyson, and he looked anything but in shape. So explain that. I mean, I, I'm taking you for your word um, yeah, that, no, that no, he's taking it serious, but that wasn't that long ago. He didn't look that, he looked a little soft. Listen, Tyson always looked soft. Have a look at him at every fight he's ever done. <laughs> that's he a, fair, that's a fair point. <laughs> no, no, that Spencer, but so he looked he even soft until you get waxed on the chin. He looked even softer, <laughs> and okay. and so, he, so he look he he looked like the Pillsbury dough boy on steroids, okay. Um, right. okay. so, or an extra so. dough. But what? But seriously, is he has he changed? Has he started getting serious since then? And uh, take it from there. His dietary, he's flown his, he has a, he has his own dietary guy in who makes his food. So you using George Lockhart still? Yes, George Lockhart. You probably know him very, very well. Very good dude. He spends time with my friend Jelly Roll here in uh, Nashville. That's right. He does, does a lot of work with him. And Teddy, we use Chris Cam Chris Camacho, who was with Teddy and I in camp with uh, Alex Vosdick, was trained by George Lockhart. So Teddy, they have a connection. Camacho was friends was trained by um, Tyson's nutritionist. So tell tell us where he's at now, Spencer, as far as mentally mentally and and of course training wise. Mentally fantastic in a great place. One of the best places I've seen him for a very very long time. His own brother brothers who know him inside out are so happy because he's in that good place. I get what you're saying about the, 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 the weight, but he floats around at 21, 21 and a half. He's now at 21. It'll be on the nose at the fight, 19-2. You're talking about stones, right? Stones? You're talking about... Stones, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know what it is, yeah pounds. Cal break that down in pounds for the audience out there. Not everybody knows what I, the I don't know of pounds. stones. I'm not Kennel, it's a lot that. of pounds. Just, is that fair? It's a lot of pounds? Is that fair? Um, a, lot of <laughs> a lot of pounds. A lot of pounds. It'll be 19 to on the night. How much is that? Is that 260, 270? What is that? Two, 269 pounds. All right, good. 269 pounds. But bear in mind, he's, six, he's nearly 6'10". 269, so, 269, he ain't going to make weight in the UFC. you got to be 265. Correct, but he could always <laughs> take that off. That's not that's not a big issue. To I'm kidding. That's, that's yeah, water that's weight. weight. Um, um, so it'll, it'll be that on the night. He'll be, you know, his engine is second to none. He could, I mean, I could walk in the gym now, even looking like the Pillsbury Doughboy, could do 18 rounds, no problem, no hassle. We just went to we went to Thailand uh, two three two three months ago, and he 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 jumped in with 18. Decent kickboxers and done eighteen rounds, no problem. He wow. hadn't, he hadn't, he hadn't done any training. Bro. No, his experience, he's relaxed the ring. That's his domain. Correct. Uh, let me let me ask you, what can we expect? What can the fans out there expect if they go and get this on pay per view? Wh what are they going to see? I don't know if he's making a prediction. I've, I've got to tell you what sort of a show this is going to be. So the guy who put this together is a uh, is a big big boxing fan. His name is His Excellency Al Turk. Um, he's he's a, a very 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 big boxing fan. He's the one who came up with all this. He it's all down to him. Um, we when we first when we first went to do the deal with him, uh, we weren't sure ourselves, but. He's a very serious operator, and you will see a show that you you'll never see before. This guy is throwing the kitchen sink at it, you know, and he wants to show people that um, Saudi Arabia is a major force and will be a major force in boxing. This is going oh, to be in all sports. I mean, look what they're doing at golf and uh, correct I mean... football, soccer, you name it. But this guy, we've got him on our side. He's a massive boxing fan which is a, a big plus for us, you know, and, and, and they're a group who work tirelessly morning, noon and night, and they're going to make this a sense. I mean, I've seen the plans for it. It's incredible. 
we're not just going to get a boxing match. We're going to get a proper show. The undercard's phenomenal. Can you tell us anybody on the undercard? Can you mention any of the undercard? So, um, Joe Parker, he will be fighting um, uh, a guy from Canada called um, Simon, Simon Name or Simon Main. He's 23 and 1. He's on the undercard. Um, we've got Fabio Wardley against um, uh, David Adelaide. Is he the Albanian welterweight? Is he the Albanian welterweight who's very popular? Um, no, no, no. So okay. Fabio Wardley is the British champion. Oh, okay. Um, and David Adelaide's a very, very good uh, heavyweight as well. Um, spars with Tyson an awful lot. We've also got um, we've also got on the card Martin Bacoli um, against Carlos Sackham. Now, for me, Martin Bacoli's a top five world fighter. He's unbeaten. He's um, well, sorry. Well, I think he was beaten once actually. I think he was beaten once, but he's a he's a he's a wrecking ball of a man. He's a heavyweights. They're heavyweights. Uh, oh, heavyweights. Yeah. We've got and we've we've got Sir Roberto Duran's grandson on there as well, fighting an ex MMA kid from from England, who's uh, British standard. Um, I'm just uh, his name's uh, Jack McGann. And he was a he was an MMA who's gone over to the boxing and probably done better than anybody in the boxing job, you know. So we're looking forward to that as well. Well, you mentioned a great name. I mean, the great great Roberto Duran is also going to be over there. I think I'm going to be there too. I I, I well, think. I hope so because we really want you over there. We think um, we, we've got we've got I think 35 ex world champions from George Foreman right down Larry Holmes. I mean, it's Barrera, Ricky Hatton, it's, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, Terence Crawford's going to be there. Oh, wow. Well, I know you guys You guys invited me to come, so I appreciate that. Uh, we'd, lo we'd love you to come over, and you, Ken. So if you want to come over as well. Um, again, this is all orchestrated um, by His Excellency over there. Turk Al Sheikh, he, he is the man who's he's putting everything into it. He's got film styles going. He's got um, singers going. He's got world champion boxers going. It's going to be a, an absolute phenomenal event. And I and I just I hope everybody buys into it and watches it. And don't because I don't think that um, I don't think that Francis Ngannou is it, you know is going to get knocked out in round one or round two. This is not going to be easy. You know he's got an equaliser. You know, like you said, you've been in the middle of him. He's got a tremendous equaliser for anybody. If he can detonate and land it, we're not going to know what happens. Well, listen, Spencer, you um, you asked me to come on here at the last minute, and I was happy to accommodate you. I'm always happy to accommodate good people, and um, you know, that's you could say this or that, but for me, the Furies and their family and. You know, Ken touched on it. My daughters told me about the show, um, the reality show. At the end of the day, they're good people. I mean, they're they're fun people. They they're this, they're that. But at the end of the day, I believe good people. And I I think you'll find that Tyson Fury will go down as one of the great boxing legends ever, because after this, we have got we've got such a surprise for everybody. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk a little bit about that. And um, before we even touched on that, you told me, which I appreciate, we'll just say it one more time, Tyson's going to come on this podcast, and I appreciate that um, very much. You know, we, we very heavily work with Frank Warren, with George Warren, his son, who's doing a great job, Bob Aaron. They're all involved in this. So some of the best, biggest and best promoters in the world are involved in this this promotion. So talk to us now about um, something that is really big. Um, big for the sport. Uh, big for the... Big, obviously, for the... I always say the, the thing that leads the heavyweight... If, if the, the head of the snake, if you will, of, the, of boxing is always the heavyweight division. If that's doing well, usually the rest of the sport is f following in a pretty, a pretty good stream, a pretty, pretty yes. good path. And um, so, talk about 
to the point that you can. I know some of you can't completely divulge, but talk about what we can look forward to as a massive uh, uh, happening that's going to be happening. I can't divulge anything that's going on at the moment, but all I can say to you is that if if you had a Christmas wish list that you want what a fight that you wanted to see in the heavyweight division um it could very very well happen i mean what would your wish list be what would your wish list be my christmas list would be to see number one tyson fury the heavyweight champion of the world in with the other heavyweight champion of the world Usyk. that would be my christmas wish i mean the uh, uh, the second one would be uh, no. If I was from there across no the pond, there is no second. Uh, if I was from across the pond, if I was across the pond, um, Ken Ken has learned from me he's very, very good, well, Ken. as you can see. Um, he's he 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 knows what to say, and he's he's right. But I I cover all bases. If I was from across the pond, I would want the Christmas in my stockings probably. To be, you know, you crazy English fans over there, you're crazy in love with your heavyweights and your boxing. And I appreciate that. I admire that. But it would probably be to see Fury against Joshua. But the one that we really want to see, the one that has to be the most important one for the sport and for the fans, is to see the two heavyweight champs get in the ring and come out with one heavyweight champ of the world so i'm guessing can i guess at those yeah you can guess and and this all i can really tell you because i've had to sign things to say i'm not allowed to disclose any of this so i i can't literally can't but i'm going to say this that the, the saudis again is excellent in turk our shape will make everybody's christmas come true that's what I can say. <laughs> well, hey, Spencer. Good. Spencer, do you watch wrestling? Uh, a little bit. You know, you know The Rock, so I just want to premise this, preface this by saying, I'm just quoting The Rock here, but I would say, hey, what do you think is the second best fight? It doesn't matter what you think the second best fight is. The only one that matters is Fury against Usyk. That's what everybody wants. The rest of it we can sort out later. We are wait, working hard to make everybody's Christmas come true. I, they Tyson calls me the snowman, so hopefully I can I can help with that. And I've got the shade of Harvard Christmas anyway, so let's hope I can definitely get you the present you wanted. Well, you've done a good job so far, and obviously you're you're very it's very nice to talk to you. Like like all the like the furies that you that you represent. Um, that you're friends with and you also represent as a manager, you're a fun guy to talk to, a nice guy to talk to. Um, you you all present yourselves as the most important thing you can present yourself as, a decent person, a person that you enjoy talking to, a person that you walk away saying, you know what, it was nice meeting that bloke. I use that term because that's that's from across the pond. We're, we're massive, we're massive, massive followers of, of yours and Ken, can't keep our eyes off you. Um, and you, your name in England and probably across the world is fantastic. So I take my hat off to the pair of you. Keep doing what you're doing. And hopefully I can come back someday or one day soon and we can talk again. Yeah, Spence, the next time you come on after this payday in Saudi Arabia, I'll expect to see you with an Automair Pegay on both arms. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I'll bring you some pictures. <laughs> please do <laughs> i don't think you need this payday to get that if you chose to get that i think you i think you're doing pretty good already spencer but um god bless you god bless the pair of you thank you thank you for having me on and tell tyson congratulations on his uh the latest addition to his family thank you very much boys all the best thanks spence god bless all right, Teddy, that was fascinating with uh, Spencer. Sounds like we may get our dream fight of a, a unified heavyweight champ. Man, what a uh, what a treat that would be to see the best two guys fighting each other, one man owning all the belts. Um, great job getting that lined up, Teddy. 
Yeah, well, you heard it here first. If 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 it comes true, if it comes true that that's what it is, you know, he of course he's he is uh, under under strict obligation where he can't talk about or can't formally, you know, say it. Under but gag order. He gave us enough. Yeah, under gag order, so to speak. But he's I think he said enough. Um and I appreciate that he wanted to say it here on our podcast because he feels that obviously that we get traction and we get people listening to us and the right people listening to us and that he gave us that kind of uh acknowledgement, that kind of respect, uh, to wanna to talk about it to want to talk about it here and also to talk about the Nganyu fight, which I, I think it could be a fly in the ointment. I really do, that if they don't take that serious, you know, I know it's an event, I know it's a money grab, I get it, uh, and it's titled a so-called exhibition, but when that bell rings, the only thing exhibition is going to be the name of it. There, there's, uh, they're trying to hurt each other. They're trying to, catch, especially in Ganyu. I mean, there'll be no quick, uh, you know, ticket to stardom uh, than, than to knock out the heavyweight champ of the world. I mean, there's nothing that could suddenly put him in. You talk about a demanding position. You talk about a powerful. You talk about the throne uh, and sitting on the throne. Uh, that that would be basically, huh, uh, that, would, that would be one of the, the greatest uh Upsets. It would be. A, it would get news everywhere around the world, obviously, and it would be tantamount to a a government having a coup done on it, where suddenly one day somebody's sitting. I used <laughs> the the word f throne. Somebody's sitting in the top chair one day, and then bang! All of a sudden, he ain't in the top chair. You got somebody out of nowhere that has made a complete uh, overrun of the government, uh, if you will, uh, the government of boxing, the government of heavyweight boxing, even though he's not a boxer. So I I don't know. It, it could be a giant fly, giant fly anointment. That doesn't, that's, doesn't appropriately really, you know, give you the, the magnitude of what it is because, uh, you know, and Ganyu and Fury, you talk about flies. I mean, it's more like it would be a pterodactyle uh, in the oil. Pterodactyl. If you will. The pterodactyl. I got to get my grandson on to <laughs> pronounce these dinosaurs' names the right way. That's the only way I know about a pterodactyl. He taught me about that. But for those that don't know, that don't have grandchildren or young kids, it's a dinosaur with wings. All right? <laughs> and that would make a mess of things in any ointment, in any pond, in anything, um, and and in the heavyweight champions' uh, plans for the future. That that, like I said, like we talked about on the on the interview, he better be taking them serious. He better be taking them serious because, and Ganyu is taking it serious, and and he's looking at it the way you should look at it, like call it whatever you want to call it, exhibition, money grab. But when I go and put my right hand on his chin and I knock him out, I'm going to be the man. Yeah, to your point, if we're standing in a bar and two guys get up to fight and you're like, well, one guy's a boxer, you're like, those two guys are going to start throwing bombs and the first one to connect with a clean one is going to win the fight. And so to think Francis doesn't have a chance would be incredibly naive for everyone because we've seen him knock out gigantic grown men in the cage obviously on a technical on a technical standpoint tyson should box his ears in on paper but this is a fight and in a fight anything can happen but the other thing i wanted to say is look i can't imagine spencer wants to ask you last minute to come and join us on the show if he didn't have something serious to report so i my, i would assume that we're getting that Usyk uh fury fight but TBD, but either way, nice of him to come on and think of us and uh, give us that little scoop. Hopefully it becomes a reality. Um, tons of action this weekend. Contrary to popular belief, while some of the biggest names weren't necessarily in action, there was a ton of fight action this weekend. Two shows on Friday, two, three shows on Saturday. The UFC was in action per usual. Um, so let's jump into it. You want to start with the UFC? 
Yeah, let's start with that. We got those great UFC, great boxing fans, but great UFC. And quite frankly, the UFC fights were bigger fights in, in this particular case because uh, bigger names, uh, more impactful fights. Title uh, on the line. Yeah, yeah, title on the line. I think we had a title fight over on Friday. Was it Friday night? Uh, I think we did. But, you know, not not the kind of magnitude of fights. Um, obviously, it doesn't always have to be a Canelo attached to it, you know, or, or you know, a, 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 a Spence or... or um, Fury, Triple G. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, Crawford, it, it doesn't have to be those names attached yeah. to it to be... Uh, a, a fight of substance, a consequential fight. But the UFC fights, I think it's fair to say, were on the whole were bigger fights over the weekend. So we'll start with those. And, yeah. and then we're going to cover the other ones too. Yeah, let's do it. Um, let's start with the uh, fight right before the co-main, Raul Rosas Jr. Uh, I believe he's still 18 years old, moves his record to 8-1, and one, just completely overwhelms and annihilates Terrence Mitchell. Uh, first round knockout, I mean, uh, basically someone stood in the middle of the road and a car came by and just ran him over. One-sided the whole time. Uh, how'd you like that kid, Rosas? At 18 years old, Teddy, to your point, when you see a kid who's 18 years old that's fighting at that high level, I mean, how many fights could he have since he turned 15 in three years, right? So it's just, I don't know. I'm astounded when I see someone in their teens in there competing in the open division against grown men. It's just, it's, it's, it's incredible. How'd you like it? He's the youngest, to, to make it even more clear, he's the youngest fighter in the UFC, all right? So, yeah, to be doing what he's doing at this level, not just beating anybody, but, you know, beating, you know, fighters of worth at this level he, he's he had to be in the gym young as a kid even even if he wasn't fighting yet he had to be in the gym obviously learning the craft and absorbing what has to be absorbed as far as the the mental side of being a fighter of making that making that transition that you know into being able to be calm in an uncalm environment uh, being able to see things that others won't see when there is chaos in front of you, where there's fear in front of you, where there's elbows, legs, punches uh, in front of you to be able to sort through all that stuff. Let me give you one more stat. According to uh, Tapology, that's kind of like a box rec website, his first amateur fight was in 2000, January of 2020. So he fought the whole year. So you're talking about two and a half years of um, fighting, right? Or three and a half years. And he had, and he's had his second fight in April of 21. And in, in August of 21, he had his first pro fight. So he had two amateur fights three and a half years ago. And now he's fighting at the highest level on the main card in the UFC. Again, it's, 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 it's insane. No, it's extraordinary. And look, Canelo turned pro when he was 16 in Mexico. <laughs> a fighter that I trained that I had the privilege. I probably didn't deserve it, but I was with Cosimano, so I got it. Um, but I was 21 years old, and I trained with Fredo Benitez, one of the greatest fighters of all time, one of the greatest Puerto Rican fighters of all time, three-division champion, uh, junior welter, welter, and junior middle. I actually trained him for the Carlos Palomino fight outdoors in Puerto Rico for the welterweight title. Like I said, I was just a kid training this great, great, great fighter. But nobody's going to break his record. And I'll tell you real quick. What That's who I was thinking of, by the way, when yeah. I was setting this up. That's exactly who I was thinking of is Wilfredo Benitez yeah. and how, how no. extraordinary he was. I mean, just, it's crazy. Well, Ken, nobody's going to come close to that record. He won the world title. I'll say it again. He didn't fight pro. He won the world title against a great fighter, um, against... Antonio Kid Pombole Cervantes outdoors in Puerto Rico in the rain. He was 17 years old, Wilfredo Benitez, when he won that title. 17 years old. Just think about that. It's, it's, I mean, it's insane. It's almost incomprehensible. Yeah, it really is. That means that he must have turned pro when he was 13, 14. So he was beating <laughs> pros, grown men, when he was 13, 14 years old. 
Uh, you know what I mean? Steady. There's certain sports you just don't see that because it takes time to develop. Another example is baseball. You don't see 18-year-old kids playing baseball oh. because they have to go through that natural process of seeing fastballs up close and personal and getting in, sitting in front of another pro fighter in the pocket when you're 16, 17 years old. It's just crazy. And it, what, this guy, to your point, was at welterweight, Benitez, right? Heavyweight, okay, the, the talent pool's junior, a little well, he thinner. He won the first title of junior. Yeah, junior, 140. The talent level at one low weights all the way up to like heavyweight. You get up to the heavier weight, there's less people. But in the middle, 40 to 50, 40, those guys are incredibly skilled. Tons of talent and well, experience. To, to think a kid that young... They're not dependent only on physicality, so they have to be great at their craft and technical at their craft. But I tell you, to to the point you're talking about, could you imagine a 17 year old playing in the NFL? No, it's it's there's certain no. sports you just don't see it. Baseball, I mean, football. Just, I mean, it, it would, you know, it would be like impossible. I know you. I know people are gonna say, you know. Uh, obviously, you had LeBron James at 18. You had other great Kobe, Moses Malone, Kevin uh, Garnett, other, uh, Kobe, Kevin Garnett at 18, coming out of high school in the NBA. Nobody was throwing punches at him. And they were just Teddy. They were just on the team. This kid was the world champion. He was better that's than what, everyone. That's it's right. Crazy. The world champ at 17. I mean, really. It, and again, that means that when he was 13, 14, he's fighting <laughs> men. You know, and 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 again, he wins the world title. He doesn't just win a pro fight. He, he wins so the and, and and not just the world title, uh, where you pick your spot sometimes and you get a softer spot, but against a great fighter in his own right, uh, against uh, Antonio Cervantes. So uh, just pretty extraordinary. Anyway, Rosas, when you said it was like watching a car run somebody over in the middle of the street. Um, I would just make one little bit addition uh, to that. It was it was a very good, it was a Ferrari or a Porsche or a very, very special car. And I'll tell you why I say it that way. He didn't just run him over. What really caught my eye about Rosas doing what he did in 54 seconds or whatever it was in the first round to get that knockout was the way he did it. He he did it calm. He did it destructive. But he did it with great technique, great form, great awareness, great instincts, great cerebral touch to it where he set it up by taking his southpaw. He took a half a step back from the southpaw because there was a little bit of a firefight going on. So what did he do? He gave Mitchell room to make a mistake. He gave him enough rope to hang himself, as we say. And he took a half a step back to let him reach in a little bit, create a more of an opening, and then... He closed the opening with a straight left hand from the southpaw position, dropped him, and then, of course, he finished the job, showed that instinct for finishing, which a lot of the UFC fighters have, and they have to have, because if you don't finish these guys, they're going to finish you later. You give them a reprieve, well, guess what? Uh, you're going to be the one in the electric chair uh, 10 minutes later, 5 minutes later. So... That's what impressed me, was the way he did it. Like when Tyson used to knock out these guys that weren't that much on the way up. The thing about Tyson, and he said it right because Customato was his teacher. He said it right, and my teacher, my mentor. And of course, I worked with Tyson for the first, you know, four years. But Cus would always say the right thing. And it stayed with Tyson. It's not that you get rid of the guy. It's not that you knock out a guy of a lesser level than you or a lesser talent than you. It's how you do it that's going to be the telling of what you're going to be. And Tyson would always say that. They would say, oh, you knocked the guy out. The guy was nothing. You did it in 30 seconds. You did it in two minutes. Yeah. And Tyson would say correctly. He would say, yeah, but I, I did what I was supposed to do 
and I did what a good fighter would do. I got rid of him in the way that a good fighter and a future world champion would. I went to the body, I stepped to the side, I made him miss two punches, and then I counted whatever it was. But in other words, there was an expertise to it. There was a level of more than just pure ferocity. And that's what I saw in Rosas. Rather than just pure ferocity, I saw a smart a fighter for 18 years old. I, I saw a fighter who has already got a lot of the package that had the wherewithal to step back, create an opportunity for Mitchell to hang himself, to to leave himself more available to reach. And then he, as I said, he closed the punch, he closed the hole with the straight left hand. So it, it got my attention uh, in, in that way. Very impressive talent as I said, melded in there with technique and smarts. Yep, agree. Uh, in the co-main, Kevin Holland in against Jack Della Maddalena. I like both of these guys. They're super entertaining. Razor close split decision, 29-28 uh, on two of the cards for Jack, 29-28 obviously for Holland on the other. Super competitive fight. I'm a big fan of Mad Maddalena. I mean, I like Holland too, but awesome fight. How'd you like it? I love Holland's uh, personality. I do. I do too. I don't know. Some people say he talks, he does this. It's never, I don't know. It's never really, it's never malicious talk. It's just like talk. It's fun. Like like for a guy who's such a serious guy and such a dangerous guy, they all are, I get a kick out of it that he talks, you know, he, he talks like a, a character that my grandchildren would be watching on, um, you know, on 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 one of the one of those TV shows, uh, like a friendly, you know, likable, harmless character, and and these guys are anything but harmless when they get in that octagon. It shows you that they're they're human beings. Yeah, they're fighters. Yeah, they're MMA fighters. They're UFC guy, and they're and they're very dangerous at what they do. Very good at what they do, but they're humans. Everyone has their own personality. But this kid has a, even though he does that for a living, where he's going there and crushing people, right? <laughs> Choking them out, knocking them out, kicking them out. But there's a personality and a dimension to him, uh, a temperament to him that is so foreign to that. So really the opposite of that. He is so likable. He's so friendly. I, I mean, after the fight, Madalena, they asked him in one of the post-fight things I watched, they asked Madalena, what was he saying to you? And and he said, well, he asked me, uh, next time you're over in the United States, you want to get together and do some sparring? And <laughs> and, he, and, and Madalena was like laughing. He said, I'm, I'm sparring with you right now. I'm, I'm, I'm in the ring with you now. I'm in the United <laughs> States, and I'm in the ring with you now. Like, it just really... Anyway, just a different dimension. Holland, more experience, great personality. Uh, Madalena is really a, he's a load. He's a load. It was a good fight. It was a well-matched fight. Uh, obviously, Holland loves to talk. Like I said, not nasty trash. Uh, very different. So, you know, I, I just love the way, <laughs> the way that he engages in conversation. But at the end of the day, uh, you had Holland, he's tall, he's long, he's very long. And obviously, he's at his best when he uses the reach, you know, and controls things on the outside. Uh, that That's what this fight was about. Madalena's shorter, Holland's longer, taller. Who's going to get to geography that better suits them for longer extended periods of time and execute? during those periods of time. That's what this fight was about. Pure. Pure and simple. And the first two rounds, it was hard to differentiate. It really was. Really was. Because they took turns at getting their geography, but nobody kept it long enough. And nobody did enough work while in it. You know, there were moments where Madalena got into the pocket and did some really nice scoring to the body, to the head. Actually, 
I liked when he backed up uh, the taller Holland because then if you get close enough, there's a lot of target with a taller guy. If you back him up, you get close enough. Now, now you can catch him. And he, he caught him some left hooks going out. I like that. That was smart. That was good. Him and his team was smart to figure that out. Um, I love when Holland used his jab to set the table to eat with the right hand. Uh, again, using his length. Holland is so smooth. He's, they should call him Silky because he is Silky smooth, that guy. He really is. And if he ever becomes more consistent at holding his feet, holding his ground on the outside, changing range but not getting out of position, not getting, you know, a little bit turned or, you know, again, out of position where he's not able to strike. If he can learn to do that, to grab the floor while moving and always be in position to strike, to, to kick, to strike, to explode, and at the same time retaining the outside advantage where he could use his reach. If he ever gets consistent in those areas, Ken, yep. uh, the, guy, the guy would be a champion. The guy would be a champion. So, and he fights, he fights everyone. So, I love the two of them. Um, again, the first two rounds, flip a coin. Uh, the, the first round, I gave it, the first round, I, I gave it to Madalena because I thought he got a little bit more work done in his domain, in his geography, when he had it. Again, nothing, nothing to write home to mother about. But he, he had a little edge, I thought. Very close round. Second round, very close. But I thought that that should have went, for me at least, to Holland. Uh, because Holland got what he needed a little more on the outside with the you know, with, with a little range uh, where he could use that long jab and, you know, set up right hands. Early on in the first round, Madalena did some good leg kicking to the long, thin legs of Holland. I don't think he kept it up a lot, but um, but he, he, I, he did some good work with it early on. As I said, Madalena did some nice body work. He throws beautiful combinations. You know who he reminds me of as a striker, Ken, that? in that world? Cool. It's, it's a high compliment. It's a high, high compliment. He reminds me a little bit of Volkanowski, where when yeah. Volkanowski is striking, and I love Volkanowski, when Volkanowski is striking, he is so buttoned up, and he can adjust right on the fly to whatever he has to do. Um, I, I saw some of that in Madalena. He's very buttoned up. He's very technically solid. His punches are short and sweet, concise, good form. You know, um, he, he, he really, he, he's really impressive uh, in those areas. And both these guys, they love to stand and strike. You know, they could go on the floor, especially Holland, but they love to stand and strike. And um, I thought the first two rounds toss up, so I gave it first one to to Mad uh, Madalena, second round to Kevin Holland, and then the third round was the only round I thought that was you could pick definitively a winner, where it was much easier, much clearer, and that was to Madalena. I thought Madalena separated himself in the third round with some, again, in, moving forward, getting in the pocket, putting combinations together, body and head, catching Holland a few times, stepping out. Uh, that third round was the only round for me that was easy to score. The only one. And so, all for that, you know, I, I had it, uh, you know, I had it, uh, two to one for Madalena and and uh, just just a very a very good performance uh, by both guys by by both guys. Yeah, excellent. Well, that sets up the uh, the fact that you were mentioning um, the the rounds and the decision. That brings us to the uh, hotly contested, uh, highly controversial. 
um, decision in the main event. It was a, a split decision draw. Um, I think to you, you know, one of the things that you'd always say is, what do you prefer, uh, chocolate ice cream or uh, cookie dough ice cream? Like, I think that you could have made a case for either girl winning. I think you can make a case for a draw, in my opinion. Now, I wasn't watching it like an analyst and trying to score each round, but I was just watching it and thinking, who would I rather be after the end of each round and then at the end of the fight? And I was like, this is a toss-up, could go either way, and I'm not going to lose sleep over it. I mean, obviously, I would if I were one of the fighters, but... I had no problem with a uh, with a draw, given the, uh, how close it was. I'd rather see a draw and give them a chance to run it back than for someone to get their heart broken. I loved the fight. I thought it was entertaining. Dying to hear your thoughts here. Well, unlike uh, listen, I can't disagree, but unlike you, where I will sway a little bit off the road, is that I I can lose sleep over it, and I'll tell you why. Because as usual. The fighters do their job. Great intriguing fight. Great intriguing fight. Damn it. The fighters do their job. But again, the the people that are in charge of the rules, you know, the administrators of the rules, they don't do their job. And and that's what screwed up a great fight. It really took some of the bloom off of the rose of really a just a great night where you have to talk about this. You have to have this hovering over your head. Controversy again, where in the last round, the deciding round, as you said, really close fifth round, really close fight, close fight, make an argument either way, either way. I had it. I had it three to one. I'll go over it more. You know, I'll break it down. Uh, in a more exact way. But I had it 3-1 to one for Shevchenko, the former champion, going into, going into the fifth round. And the fifth round, Grasso won. So I walked away 3-2. to two. But as you said, you don't lose sleep. Either way, you, either way you want to go, fine. All right. That was the way I, that I interpreted it. But what I got to lose sleep over, what I cannot, I cannot justify, I cannot just walk away from, is the fact that one of the freaking judges in the last round, and all the rounds were, were tough rounds, and there's no doubt that Grosso wound up, Shevchenko was winning the beginning of the fifth round, doing a great job, uh, the beginning of the round, striking, and all of a sudden, she made a mistake. She went for the takedown. I think that's what it was. They, they got uh, going to the floor. And on her way to the mat, she slipped. And Grasso, real quickly and brilliantly, reversed positions with her and got the edge and got her in a vulnerable position on the floor, on the mat, and controlled the rest of the round. You could say dominated the rest of the round. But don't forget, the beginning of the round, Shevchenko was winning the beginning of the round. And then made that mistake, Grosso gets on the floor and controls the rest of the round. And and the fight ends like that. All right, fifth round, no argument for me, to Grosso. Here's the problem, big problem. Are you freaking kidding me? 10-8? <laughs> 10-8? What's the matter? You didn't get enough attention when you were a kid? Huh? Huh? <laughs> so you had to go and give a 10 a round when everybody's watching a world title fight with the women? And one of the women, one of the greatest of all time in Shevchenko? And Grousel's great. But she's the new champ. Shevchenko's trying to come back and take a title. And you're going to make it, you're going to make it 10 8? Really? You're going to, I, 10-8, if it was boxing, you gotta you gotta get dropped, you gotta get hurt, you know? And if you still win the round, if the other person wins the round, you could change it to a 10-9, even though you got dropped. If, if you weren't like out and and the guy gets dropped, all right, you you got it ready to go 10-8. But then the other guy who got dropped comes back and he and he has a competitive round. All right, you make it 10-9 for the guy who or the person that dropped the person. 
But the scoring here, I mean, it, it's the same basic ideas. You know, the, you got to dominate. You got to have a person almost knocked out or submitted in order to get a 10-8. I mean, you got to do that kind of monumental damage. You got to, I didn't see it. I, I, I'm not arguing that Grasso had a good round uh, after after she got the upper hand over Chichenko making a mistake. I'm not going to deny that. But to make it 10-8, you're saying that, you know, you're saying that the next step would have been uh, you got to stop the fight. It's that one-sided. I mean, that you're going into that area, into that domain. Uh, that's a good point, Teddy, when you think about it like that. 10-8, okay, was the ref contemplating stopping this fight? Was it almost like, yeah. uh, you know what I mean? Like, no, the fight wasn't that yeah, close. Ken. It, that was yeah. not that close a situation. Great, intriguing fight. And like I said, and I had to say way too often, and I wish, you know, like I said, I wish that the, I, I just wish the officials did their job the way the fighters do. Um, and so, so that one judge, that that one judge really, really put a kibosh on, on a great night to a certain extent. Um, what a crowd. 19,000 fans, enthusiastic ones in, in Vegas at the T-Mobile Arena. Uh, what a brand. What a brand this thing is. And now they merged with WWE and, uh, you know, now they're called TKO instead of, I, I know now Dana's the CEO still running things as he always has. He's done a great job, but now he's the CEO of TKO rather than calling it UFC. I think that officially, I believe that's what's going on with the merge uh, with WWE and UFC. I mean, they were they were already a, you know, a, a behemoth, a Goliath, uh, and, and now they're like a two-headed behemoth, Goliath. Um, I didn't think they'd get bigger, but I guess they just got bigger, their brand. Uh, but again, they now had to put on a promotion. And I got to say, we're going to touch on it later, but what a stark difference. And I don't care. I just say what I feel and what I see. What a st- And I say it the other way if it turns out that way. But what a stark difference, Ken, uh, from the crowd and overall production of the, the zone fight from California uh, on Saturday night with Cepeda and and Gesta, um, which was a, a it was a Golden Boy promotion, but it was literally, literally, a, a like and the fight was one sided, but it was literally like watching a little league game compared to watching a major league game. Uh, I had to say that it, it was stark. We'll talk about it when we break that fight down later. But it really did. I, it caught my eye. Uh, usually boxing promotions are, you know, they can be every bit as good as the UFC ones. They both do a good job when it's when it's that caliber, when it's that event. But this one was not that caliber, the one with the zone with Golden Boy. But anyway. To your point about the UFC and um, uh, WWE. Yeah, so yeah. So Will, yeah, William Morris bought UFC however many years ago for $4 billion. Then they bought WWE for um, thirteen, uh, sorry, nine point three billion. The combined valuation of the two companies. This is like the magic of uh, financial math. So the the valuation, the combined valuation, right? They paid thirteen point three for the two. Now they've had UFC for a few years and developed it a little, so you would expect that it would appreciate. And but they just recently closed the WWE transaction, nine point three billion combined valuation at the recent IPO. How much? Thirteen point three is what they paid for both of them combined. What's the combined valuation? Twenty. Twenty one billion dollars. Small. Hey, seven. Uh, I could get. I could get into the finance world. <laughs> I know you can. You could. Anyone can. If those are the numbers, it just seems so. Arbitrary. I mean, good for everyone involved, but I mean, an investor coming in and paying twenty-one billion valuation to buy stock in the combined companies, yeah, it's a huge premium. And I'm not listen. I'm not trying to be critical of anyone. I'm just saying those numbers are astronomical. WME spun the whole thing off. It looks like they set up a new entity called um, TKO, that its own standalone yeah, publicly traded company owned by 
WME, so I don't know what the percentage of that the parent maintained, but clearly they sold shares of the new entity via the public markets to combine valuation of $21 billion. That is just crazy. Um, but good for everyone involved. That's what capitalism is all about. But the, the audience is there. So if people are paying the money, they're clearly generating serious revenue if the if the if the market will 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 pay that price. So well, they're Thought putting out a good product. They're putting out a good product, uh, Mr. White and those guys. But um, one one quick thing, with, yeah. one quick thing. You know who else does a good job with their product? <laughs> um, let Ath me guess. Don't tell me. Uh, Athletic Greens. Athletic okay. yeah, Greens, who also has quite an impressive valuation, but they're delivering the value. People don't pay for things that don't deliver a value. This product is probably the most important supplement that you can take for your overall health and immunity one scoop a day costs less than a cup of starbucks coffee athletic greens it's made from 75 whole food sourced ingredients you mix it with four to eight ounces of water and shoot it down in the morning easy peasy you can't go wrong with this stuff if nothing else have an insurance policy for yourself if your diet is completely dialed in Add some athletic greens just to make sure you're getting all the whole food source vitamins that are required for a healthy body. Like I said, it's made only from whole food source ingredients. It's got probiotics, prebiotics, vitamins, minerals, etc., etc. It's your one-stop shop for all your uh, vitamin supplemental needs. Go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas, and they'll send you 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Again, athleticgreens.com slash atlas to take advantage of the offer for 10 free travel packs. Go ahead, Teddy. You like the, uh, the rematch here? Sets up another potential rematch with Grasso Shevchenko. And by the way, one other thing with the Athletic Greens, it's it's a great product. More importantly, it, it does the job. It does a great job, all kidding aside. It does a tremendous job, and it doesn't cost $21 billion to get it. <laughs> that, that's always a plus. That's always, Sam likes that. Sam's over here laughing. That's, that is. That's a plus. That's a plus. All right, look. In this rematch with Shachenko, uh the former champ, one of the all-time greats, right? First of all, what struck me, she looked bigger and stronger right away. I don't know. Uh, her back looked bigger and stronger like she'd been on a weight program, something. That caught my eye. Uh, obviously, Grosso wanted to keep the new title. Shevchenko wanted to get it back. So both of their, their tremendous wills were on display, and that's what makes a good fight as well as their great, incredible skills. You had wills and skills. And um, Customato, my mentor, used to always say that the former champions, the great ones, can sometimes summon up their former greatness on one more night. Now, Shevchenko's 35 years old. Well, that's what I thought Shevchenko did. Uh, she was giving up five years to Grasso uh, at you know, Grasso was five years younger. And he also used to tell me that winning a title improves your 30%. You've heard me say this. I've said it before in the UFC world and boxing world. And it's been proven true a lot of times where the person winning the title gets 30% better just by winning the title. And I thought it was evident with Grasso. If she wasn't better, and I thought she was better, but if she wasn't even better um, than the first time, this form, this form of Shevchenko would have beaten her because Shevchenko was ready. She was ready. Um, Shevchenko, as I said, she won the first round doing what she needed to do, you know, to chase, uh, really to chase the ghost from the attic, you know, to get the confidence back after having been in there and submitted by a, Grasso in their last fight. Uh, so that it was important for her to get off to a good start and get that confidence she needed. And she did. Uh, then Grasso showed she wasn't, you know, she was she just wasn't willing to give up the title that she just got. Grasso won the second round. So I had a 1-1 going into th uh, third. Both were very tough, strong, and smart. The third round was as I, as I was, you know, as I recapped earlier. Shevchenko, I thought, 
I, you know, I, I thought that Suchenko, like I said, I, I had it, let's see, I had a 1-1. One, one. Uh, third round was Suchenko. I gave it to Suchenko, the third round. Uh, so I had it 2-1 to one, Suchenko going into the fourth round. And the fourth round was close. Shachenko did a good job with with the jab and with counter punching. So I gave her the round. It was a close round. I gave her the round. So as I said at the top, that's how I got to three to one. Where I had it three to one for Shachenko, the former champion, going into the fifth and final round. Fifth round. Shachenko was winning a round, striking with a jab, controlling range. She did a good job with a jab, Shachenko. Uh, and then, as I already said, she was taking Grasso to the mat, you know, and uh, she slipped, made a mistake, whatever you want to call it, and Grasso capitalized. Made a great move to switch positions with Shachenko, who, uh, who had control up to that moment, and then Grasso got position and took full control for the last part of the round on the mat. And around no, and as I said, won the round, but not 10 8. Not 10 8. You know, and if you go by, you know, you take away that 10 8 and you make it 10 9. As, I sh- as it should have been, Ken. That means that Shachenko gets her title back. That means that she wins. Instead of it being a draw, and the draw the champion keeps it, you have to win to take the title. A draw the champion stays champion. So Grasso keeps the title. If that was scored properly, 10-9, again, you would have been here and, and knew, and once again, champion Instead of, and still. And taking nothing away from Grasso. She fought a great fight. She earned the right to stay champ. And she did. Uh, you could understand Shachanko being upset. And and she said something she probably would have been better off, Ken, not saying. You know, afterwards. She had a huge crowd there. Uh, and she said the judges wanted to give it to Grasso who has Mexican heritage because it was Mexican Independence Day. And the crowd, obviously heavily, you know, heavy Mexican audience, uh, they, they turned on her and they started booing. And listen, she has every right, uh, Shachanko, to say that she thought she won. But as I said, she, she would have been better off just saying, hey, I thought I won. You know, I know that, Grasso is, you know, is, is your person, is you're proud of her. She's a great champion, but I, I thought I I thought I won. Instead of, you know, saying it the way she said it. But hey, Grasso was great. They were both great, strong, technically sound, um, down on the mat, grappling, doing all the stuff that they do down on the mat. Uh, they were putting on a display of their great skills, their great wills. My respect, applause goes out to both of them. Um, as I often say, Ken, they not only fought like champions, they behaved like champions. I tweeted I tweeted at the end of the night, uh, I tweeted this out. So I thought it would only be appropriate that I kind of, that I went back to it and and I talked about it and emphasized what I was saying uh, in that tweet. Uh, I, I had said that the fighters get tested for illegal substance, substances. Why shouldn't the judges get tested too? Uh, to make sure that they're not drinking, getting high, you know, before fight, you know, and any any of those things that obviously uh, should not be going on. Uh, why shouldn't they get tested? Why not? They have a great responsibility where they're 
influence in people's careers and lives, right? The, uh, you know, uh, potentially millions of dollars can be at stake in some cases. You know, you can't drive a car or operate machinery while under the influence of alcohol or drugs. So I don't think you should be able to judge a fight uh, that can obviously, you know, impact someone's life, you know? So that's a powerful tweet I put out there. But I, like I said, I wanted, to, I wanted to revisit it in a very clear way. I'm not saying that I know that judges are out there doing drugs or drinking before a fight. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying they have a very, very responsible position. I think we forget that sometimes. That's impacting people's lives. The fighters are tested. Why that? Why shouldn't they be tested? What do you think of that, Ken? <laughs> yeah, that goes without saying. I mean, I think that there's a lot of problems that go on with those positions. Like, for one, how do you get them? A politician gets to appoint the athletic commission. There shouldn't be any other process. It's an assigned position, one that's so important that requires incredible experience and competence. And we've got guys that most people have never heard of that don't have a history in the sport. They, they're not trainers. They're not uh, former fighters for the most part. I mean, obviously, there there may be some, but I don't even know of any so yeah i would think that you should have some kind of deep understanding of the sport you certainly should know more than most of the fans um but yeah i i, I think that that would be a good first step to make sure they're sober <laughs> the fact that we even have to question that is <laughs> crazy enough <laughs> 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 that might help <laughs> that might be a good idea <laughs> that might be a good uh, let me think uh, I think I got a good idea here uh, uh, let's make sure that these guys uh, aren't drunk when they're uh, judging each fight yeah that's a good one yeah, let's, put that, let's put that to a vote now on the floor <laughs> uh. <laughs> I'm sorry put it, I, put it I to a vote <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness my goodness oh my goodness this, this is such a good show. It's a fun show. I hope everybody's enjoying it. I hope so. Really. You know what? Even the judges out there, have a drink on us. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. I mean, come on. I'm only kidding. Uh, uh, really. But, um, well, we had, a, we had other boxing. I don't know if everybody would cover all these fights. For, but you know what? We are. We are. Friday, and uh, there was a bunch of fights Friday. And one of them was tremendous. A couple of them were very good, actually. But we we had fight Friday and Saturday, so let's go to it. Yep, let's jump into it on Friday night. Um, on ESPN, we have Louis Lopez retains his IBF featherweight title. He gets a unanimous decision over Joette Gonzalez. Um, judges had it pretty one-sided, 118-110, 17-11, and 16-12. I thought it was a little bit more competitive, but again, I wasn't watching it from a, a judge's perspective, but those little guys always bring the action. How'd you like it? Yeah, listen. It came down, I thought the... <laughs> I, I understand some people had a little bit of a hard time with the spread of the scores. I had the... I thought the right, right guy got the fight and won it. And I didn't... It could have been a little closer, but I didn't have a big problem because for me it comes down to, do you know what the hell you're watching? Do you know how you're watching and how you should be watching? What do I mean by that? I think that boxing needs to make it much clearer to the judges. Even go to class, go to school for this. Be mandated to take seminars every year for this. Where... The criterion, the clear criterion for scoring is explained to them and mandated to them that they must follow it. It's got nothing to do, it shouldn't be, you know, I know there's always a subjective element, but it shouldn't be that subjective. It should be where the person that's landing the harder, cleaner, more consequential, more effective punches wins the fight or wins the round. Not the person who just throws. 
One person could throw 50 punches. The other person could throw 25. But if the person throwing 50, they don't land clean, and the person throwing 25 land clean or cleaner, that person wins. That's where we have a problem because the judges, they get swayed sometimes by aggression, even if it's not effective. They get swayed by volume, even if they're not landing or landing consequentially. I don't think they understand the criterion clear enough. I really don't. Now look, there's always the element of corruption. I've talked about that. Go and sign my petition that's up there that we're bringing to Congress to get Congress to get a national commission to clean that up. So, um, but if it's not corruption, it's incompetence. Neither one can be tolerated when they influence the future of somebody's life. Somebody who's putting their life on the line when they get in the ring. They, they, they shouldn't have to hope that judges get it right. They, they, they should feel a little bit more safer with that uh, and confident with that. So I think that's got a lot to do with it. I really do. Um, the first thing I want to say, breaking it down, Lopez Gonzalez... IBF featherweight title, so it was for a world title. This was his third try at winning a title, and you got to feel for him. Um, the third one was not the charm. Basically, he's the equivalent of the Buffalo Bills going to three straight Super Bowls and not winning. You know, uh, I mean, I I'm not saying he fought three consecutive times for the title, but three times he hasn't gotten it. Uh, if I'm going to use that kind of, you know, comparison with other sports, the Bengals, they're 0-3 in Super Bowls. The Vikings, I remember when they lost all those Super Bowls. My God, the Purple People Eaters. I loved them. I loved those guys. Carl Ella, Marshall, uh, Grant was their coach. He wouldn't let them wear sweatshirts when it was 20 below. He wouldn't let them wear... He was a tough guy, Bud Grant. He wouldn't let them wear, Ken, long sleeve shirts. And he wouldn't allow heaters on the sidelines, those butane heaters back in those days. Now they got everything. <laughs> they got heated seats so your tukas will be warm. You know, they, they, they got everything. But back in those days, they didn't. that's all they had, butane heaters sometimes. He didn't even allow them. And like I said... He made you wear a short sleeve shirt. This guy was, he was a tough guy. I, I think he was an ex-Marine, but he was a tough guy, tough coach. But with all that said, it didn't help him win a Super Bowl because they went 0-4 in all the Super Bowls that they were in. Um, Gonzalez, he did everything he could. He tried his best to win the title. Um, the champion... Lopez was, I think his last fight, he knocked out Mickey Conlon, the Olympian. Uh, Mickey Conlon was a champion for five minutes, uh, you know, over in Belfast, over in Ireland, where he was popular. I think he won an interim title that he didn't keep too long. But uh, Lopez was coming off that, I think it was a pretty vicious knockout win over Conlon. Gonzalez was... Two different styles. Gonzalez, longer, taller. He was busier, used his jab to set everything up, you know, in a very traditional way, if you will. Lopez was the opposite. The champion, for the most part, he doesn't really use his jab to set up shots. First of all, he's looking for power shots. He steps in to position. He walks you down. He sets up his power shots, and he does it by placing them in a very accurate way. He really does a great job of walking into position and placing clean, hard punches. And that's why he won the fight. Yeah, he was outworked. Yeah, he was out-hustled, if you will, uh, by Gonzalez trying to win the title after three tries trying to make the, you know, the third one the charm. But Lopez was the one who follows that criterion for professional boxing. 
he was landing the harder, more effective punches for the most part throughout the night. Bottom line, Gonzalez, you know, it, it was really quantity versus quality. And Gonzalez won the battle um, of quantity, but he lost the war of quality because Lopez won that in that in that area. Good fight. Uh Lopez, the harder puncher. Gonzalez, like I said, the busier. The judges scores big for Lopez. Most people thought it was closer. Uh, you touched on it. Funny, Ken. Uh, one of the ESPN commentators had Gonzalez winning, giving him the last two rounds. I gave Gonzalez the 11. It did feel like a fight that would come down to the end. It did, a little bit. I gave Gonzalez the 11th round. But the 12th round, I gave it to Lopez for the same reason I gave him the fight. He landed the cleaner, more effective punches. The 11th round, Lopez did a good job. He, he landed more and he threw more. But not throughout the night. Uh, as I said, I think the problem is understanding criterium. The judges don't always understand them. The judges are too much like weathermen sometimes where they're all over the damn play, uh, place with forecasts. One minute they're telling you it's going to be sunny. The next minute they're telling you, you know, button down the hatches, there's a hurricane coming. I mean, uh, the judges are like that. They're all over the freaking place. And obviously that's a problem. And it's been a problem for a long time. So, as for Gonzalez, like I said, yeah, you feel for him losing the third shot at a title. Uh, bottom line, he's a good fighter. He makes good fights. But he loses when he steps up to that next level. I mean, it's not, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm just pointing out truth. I'm not knocking the guy. He's an earnest fighter. And he's fought three times for a world title that he's deserved. But when he goes to that next level, he's just not able to get it done. Um, the last thing I say is I was looking at the way they use their announcers now uh, on ESPN. And they they no longer have, you know, they let what's his name go um what was his name? The the former champion. Andre um, Ward. Yeah, they let Andre Ward go. But now they got Craigle, you know, the writer, who really, they used him. I thought they used him like Harold Letterman used to be used at HBO. Sorry, say that again. You broke up. Who did you say they let go as well? No, no, they, they let Andre Ward go. Yeah, yeah. But, Oh, I thought you yeah, said they let but, someone else go. Sorry. No, no, no. That's all right. But Craigle, they yeah, Mark used Kriegel. Him the other night. Yeah, they used him the other night. The way that Harold Letterman was used by HBO, where Letterman would give scores, and then he would always throw in his his opinion, you know, his two cents. And Craigle was kind of, I'm not saying reduced to that, but it was interesting that. It just felt like that's the position that they they had him in, at least that night. Um, anyway, that's it for that fight. There was an undercard fight. Go ahead. You want to set that up, Ken? Yeah, of course. Uh, Puerto Rican fighter prospect Xander Zayez uh, runs his record to 17-0 and with 11 knockouts. He got the fifth round TK over Roberto Valenzuela. Uh, he had him down twice in the first round. It was you know, seemingly uh, predetermined uh, just blowout for Xander Zayas. How'd you like him? I'm going to give a quick scouting report on on this 21-year-old unbeaten prospect. And it's a good one. It's a good one. Um, and one that I think can be trusted since I don't just rubber stamp all these guys as great automatically just because the promoter would like me to. Uh, which some people do, honestly. 
He's technically solid. Does everything off the jab. He's patient. He's mature at 21 years old. He picks spots very well. He doesn't make mistakes. You know, in other words, he doesn't help you beat him. He has talent and a temperament that is to be... His temperament is to be cautiously aggressive. Uh, I, he looks like a complete fighter. He counters. He presses at times. He moves, you know, when he needs to move and uses his legs to switch things up and shake things up a little bit, get different looks from different places in the ring. He stopped Valen Swell on cuts, but as you alluded to, he was dominating the fight. And I walked away saying he's a real prospect. Yeah, good. Well, that was, uh, he certainly looked sharp to me. I was dying to hear what you thought. That was um, the Friday night show for ESPN. Showtime also had uh, their new generation card, and Ramon Cardenas uh, runs his record to 21, 22 and 1 with 12 knockouts. Got a second round stoppage of Rafael Pedroza. Uh, this was a big upset, uh, at least according to the odds makers in the Bantamweight division. Rafael P- Pedroza g- drops to 15 and 1. Um, good matchup. Sometimes Showtime puts on a couple good ones. They slip through the cracks, but this was a great fight. Two young guys. Uh, I liked it. What'd you think? I didn't think it was a great fight. I thought it was a, I I, I thought it was uh, unless you think watching a, a building get knocked over by, uh, <laughs> uh, you know what what do they call those balls those um a wrecking uh, ball a wrecking ball yeah unless you like to sit and watch a wrecking ball come in and crash I should, well, a I building should, down I should that, that used to be a nice looking building you know hey that was a nice looking building boom oh let me clarify no so anytime. Nice. Anytime you see an upset where it looks on paper like they're setting yeah, it up for one saying. guy to get a walk I, over, I it was entertaining to me to be like, oh, shit, we got yeah. this completely wrong. This guy ruined no, the party. If you, Yeah, yeah, I get it. I mean, look, to that point, yeah. Uh, again, if you like to watch a wrecking ball, you know, come in and demolish a freaking a building that a minute ago looked like a pretty good building, um, then you loved it. But for me, you know what this fight was all about, Ken? For me. You had the 15-0 and 0 against the 22-1. and 1. It was a perfect example of, of what I've been saying and why I say it for years in this business. That these managers and promoters, they're not doing their prospects. They're not doing their fighters. Their responsibility. They're kids. They're not doing them any favor favors when they feed them to 15 and 0 16 and 0 20 and 0 whatever the figure was this case was 15 and 0 we're talking about pedroza pedroza when you feed the raw meat you heard me talk about it ken you're right with me you're right with me side by side how it's like feeding time at the zoo they they feed these guys raw meat nothing but a freaking you know liquid diet no whole foods I mean, they just swallow up these opponents. They don't learn a damn thing. You don't learn a damn thing about them, you know? And if they don't happen to have really already the developed abilities from the amateurs, like, you know, two, three hundred amateur fights, if they don't have that and they already are really concrete uh, in in their development in, in those areas, you're really doing them a disservice. You're really doing what they do to the turkey on Thanksgiving Day. You're fattening them up for the freaking oven. You're fattening them up for the slaughterhouse. You're fattening them up for that platter. And they fattened Pedro's up for that platter. That platter that was served to Cardenas. uh, Cardenas. Um, And and you don't like the way I say things in a very forward, straightforward, you know, strong way, honest way. Well, uh, go somewhere else. Because that that's what that's what was done here. That they they built this guy. Maybe they fooled themselves too. But that is that is where you pay a price. That's where you pay a price. Where yeah, it was nice, fifteen and all for the first two years, three years. And you're building this guy up, you're building his ego up, you're building his record up, but you're not teaching him how to fight. 
You're not building his confidence up. You're not building his confidence up. I felt I needed to say that twice. And that's the most important thing you could be building up. And what happens? You get in there with a guy like Cardenas who's fought better fighters, who has been in with better fighters, who has been tested. And what happens? You get destroyed. You get, and you might never recover from it. You get knocked out in the second round. Devastating. Devastating. So going in, Pedroza, there were warning signs. He had been on the floor three times. See, I look at everything. He'd been on the floor three times coming into this fight. And when I would call the fight for the audience, I would put this out there right away. Hey, guys, I'm, I'm giving you a consumer warning. I'm, yeah, uh, buy at your own, buy at your own, you know, beware buyer. Buy at your own potential peril. If you're buying this guy and thinking he's great, as you would be led to believe maybe as 15-0, and 0, and that he's the big favorite that the bookies have him as and really belongs to be, go ahead at your peril, at your peril, because he's been on the floor three times coming into this fight, and in hindsight, that really was kind of like seeing those dark cumulus clouds coming where you just knew rain was coming. Uh, <laughs> in this case... Thunder and lightning freaking came with it. But Pedroza, taller, longer, it didn't help. He stands up too straight. Cardenas uh, was evident right away that he was physically stronger and a much better puncher. And perhaps the most significant stat going into the fight was that the undefeated and untested Pedroza, all of his fights, Ken, had been in his native Panama. This was his first time fighting outside of there. I don't think he wants to come back. <laughs> yeah, that's fair to say. <laughs> and <laughs> first time fighting outside of Panama, and maybe the last. Pedroza, he was, he was in a conventional stance, an approach using a jab, but like I just said, standing too erect, uh, at least standing for a little while because it didn't last too long. Uh, Cardenas scored two knockdowns in the second round with left hooks. He was both accurate and calm, which obviously helps you to be accurate. He set up his punches beautifully. I want to give him the full credit here. I want to give him the full credit. He looked for his spots. Cardenas used a beautiful classic combination, Ken, to score the first knockdown. The same one that the man of steel, Tony Zell, one of the great middleweight champions ever, he used to use it. And he used it as Rock he used it against Rocky Graziano uh, in one of their I think they fought what did they fight? Three times? Um and Zell won two of three. Yeah, I think so. But he he used it against Rocky Graziano uh, in one of those fights where he would throw the right hand to the body and then come up with the left hook to the head. Freeze you with the body shot and then put you to sleep with the left hook upstairs. That was just a classic, great executed combination by Cardenas, Cardenas to get the first knockdown. Then the second knockdown, he just... He got in the pocket, he waited for Pedroza to start to punch, and then he timed him brilliantly, and he beat him to the mark with a beautiful left hook as Pedroza dropped his right hand and opened himself up as he started to throw his own punch. Just a meticulous performance by Cardenas. Uh, I, if I was scoring uh, in a classroom... I give him an A plus. Yeah, the high high praise. I know. I yeah, I don't give many A pluses, Ken. Nope. I don't freak it. I don't even give many A's. Um, <laughs> you know, and yep. I don't t accept apples. I don't accept <laughs> apples. You know, to get on my better side either. Um, you earn it, <laughs> or you don't. So yep.
Very fair. Next. Well, next up, uh, WBO, NABO lightweight champ Angel Fierro runs his record to 21, 1 and 2. He beats Brian Zamaripa, who drops to 13 and 2 down in Tijuana, Mexico. Um, good action fight. What'd you think? Yeah, you know what? This is the one you could have used the terminology great fight. <laughs> because, yeah, last but not least, but. It was the fight of the night. It was a great fight. Um, Sam Repo was the southpaw. Very similar to the fight I talked about earlier uh, in the Gonzalez fight, where Sam Repo was busier. Fierro was like Lopez in the Gonzalez fight. Uh on on ESPN, he was he was the guy that was he was placing the punches, you know he was he was placing the placing the shots, um, clean shots. It had a great seventh round, perhaps a candidate for round of the year. It was a really good round. Uh, Zavaripa hurt Fiera early in the round. Um, with a body shot, we've seen fighters go down from body shots, even sometimes stay down recently. Samariba opened up on him after you hurt him. And then towards the end of the round, what happens? Fierro comes back and he hurts Samariba. Almost a little bit similar to Bo Holyfield 1. When you had one of those rounds where Bo was just dominating him, and then all of a sudden a great, great Holyfield, Holyfield comes back and finds a way to come back. Fierro again, like Lopez in the Gonzalez fight, he he walks you down, he places power shots while Zemmer Ripper uses his legs. He's got more versatility. Uh, he's busier. Again, like Gonzalez in the Lopez fight on ESPN. Um, and he he mixes in boxing and really good body work. He, Zama Ripa, he was the underdog. Uh, great 10th round. Again, another great round. Fierro prepared to really appear to be behind uh in the fight uh and again he was the he was the big un- he was the big favorite i i don't know what the scorecards were can i don't know if you could find them so i i'm flying blind on that but fiero behind apparently to, to me it looked like he was he lands a big right hand in the in the 10th round oh, although Zemmer Reaper took some of the force off of it as he pulled back, if I remember right. But then Zemmer Reaper came back and engaged back with him. Zemmer Ripper used his jab while Fierro used power shots. Uh, really didn't use the jab much, Fierro. Again, similar to the other fight I talked about on ESPN. Fierro would just walk you down. He would he would walk into position, you know, to to throw his power shots rather than use the jab uh, to set them up. Yeah, I got the scorecards here. We had okay, uh, good. F- Fierro 96-94. Uh, for one ninety six ninety four for Zamaripa on one and ninety six ninety five for Fierro for the deciding uh, vote. Well, that's what it should have been. I'm glad to hear that. I mean, wh- whoever you thought won, it, sh- it it deserved to be that close. And um, uh, at the end of the day, thank you for getting those scores. Split decision, as we just said, went to Fierro. Uh, many thought though this is a little telling. Many thought that Zemmer Ripper won, and they kind of displayed their thoughts in that home crowd of Fierro. It was a home crowd for Fierro, and you heard some booing where they thought Zemmer Ripper 
You don't hear that too much. You know, uh, fans are honest, though. When you see those honest fans, it's it's nice. It, it's, it is. Um, really nice to see that even though it was their guy, they they let you know that they thought the underdog came in there and pulled it off. The, to be that honest, I I have to admire that. So anyway, uh, split decision went to Fierro in a in a really you know really good fight, really good fight. Yeah, well, in the last uh, the last one we wanted to talk about, William Zapata absolutely demolishes Mercedo Gesta. Oh, Zapata goes this won't to take long. Uh, this won't Zepeda take goes long. To, uh, twenty nine oh. and zero with twenty five knockouts. This fight to me meant nothing. He's he's done this before. He's beaten up guys who he should beat up. I don't understand what the motivation was here, other than to keep him busy. Just is not a bad fighter, but he's thirty five years old and he's shot for. <laughs> He he shot exactly. One. That's it. And, you just and, you just said it all. I mean, I don't understand. You're not testing this kid. It's a, okay. Guy got some experience, but to your point, he shot one. He goes to thirty four, four and three. I don't know what they get. What what does it pay to like? He's he's twenty seven. He's now twenty nine and all. Like it's time to it's time it's time to step up. We don't need well, to see him fight guys he's supposed to beat. I, yeah, no, you're not wrong. Listen, both of them are southpaws. Uh. Golden Boy Promotions. I touched on it earlier, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back on what I started earlier when I was talking about the UFC fights earlier in the broadcast. Uh, and I'm not l- looking to knock anyone, but I have to say that the scene in California where this fight took place did not have the look or feel of a big time or top level fight. It just didn't. Or, or a top-level television production um, or event, whatever you want to call it. First of all, it was in a tent or a bubble. I'm not sure what it was, but it had the look of a... It just had the look of a cheaper event. I mean, you know, if it's a good fight, it don't matter, but it didn't turn out to be a good fight. But it just... It didn't have that... It didn't have the look of... You know, the, the projecting this guy is being ready to fight for a world title, whatever. Um, but it didn't have the look of that kind of event. It, it was like it was in a gymnasium of a school. Uh, anyway, I'm just reporting what it felt like to me. So, more importantly, Cepeda was beyond aggressive. He was relentless and he was a puncher machine. He, he looked like one of those baseball jug machines uh, those pitching machines, Ken, where the ball keeps coming out, you know, uh, all the time so you could get batting practice. <laughs> well, that's what it was. He he was like a jug machine, just, you know, a punching machine instead of uh, a pitching machine. And it was batting practice uh, for the most part. Uh, where he just kept throwing punches, again, southpaw, he overwhelmed the 35-year-old Jester. Uh, he was just, he was too big. He was too young, too relentless. Jester took a beating. I, I, I tell you, it was hard to watch after a while. Uh, he took a beating. Every, he's a game guy. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What a game, game, game guy Jester is. He took a beating every round for, I think it was six rounds when they finally stopped it, um, before the ref finally stopped it. Uh, because he he couldn't he couldn't drop him. I mean, and and again, it speaks to another thing that you learned if you didn't learn. Uh, no matter what his record will suggest, uh, Cepeda's not a puncher, not a puncher. He's relentless. He throws a million. Uh, he'll get you crazy if you try to do punch stats. You're gonna have to put your fingers in ice uh, afterwards to keep track of all those numbers. But he's not a banger. He's not a banger. And um, but it was a true, true beatdown. Just as showed, as I said, incredible heart. Um, there were times there that there were so many punches coming that just to look like someone who was caught in a in a rainstorm, and and, and you know they're looking for cover to get out of the rain, and and every time they try to get out of the rain. They get blown back by the winds and they can't get it out of the rain. 
They just can't. And uh, he was drenched. He was drenched. It would have been better off for him if he was drenched by rain, but he was drenched with punches. He, he, that, uh, I mean, and, and through all of that, here's the crazy thing. Why I don't think Sopeda's ready for the top, the top guys. And he, he was still able to land punches because Sopeda's, he's just not hard to find. He's right there to hit. You can catch him with uppercuts inside. You catch him with left hooks. You catch him with other punches because he's predictable. Yeah, he's aggressive. But he's throwing. He's always coming in the front door. And he's always throwing punches. So you could time him in between his punches, knowing that maybe he's going to throw five or six or seven punches. And he's going to be in that spot while he's throwing them. So... You can nail him right there in the middle and time him as he's punching. And he got caught that way by Jester. Um, as I said, he's not a he's not a big puncher. If he was, he would have gotten rid of uh Jester much earlier. Much earlier. Uh I I didn't I touched on it. I'll go a little deeper. Sepeda did not look good uh i know this is going to be hard to say for some people they're going to say he looked great you know he 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 was a puncher machine you know he was this he was that he was aaron Pryor, you know who never stopped throwing punch well he wasn't aaron Pryor. Pryor could punch and Pryor had different instincts and different capabilities um he did not look good with an overmatched opponent at least for me at this stage of his career who couldn't do anything, including punch hard enough to slow him down. Jester just couldn't, again, at this point in his career, he couldn't do anything. He didn't have enough power. He didn't have enough left in the in his career to do anything to slow down Cepeda. Uh, I'll give him credit. Cepeda mixed it up to the body and the head uh, very well putting punches together beautifully, fluidly. But his style will not work versus the top echelon of the lightweight division. I'll say it again. He's in a tough division. He's in a lightweight division. There's there's monsters there. Uh, They're going to make him pay as he comes in straight uh, that way. And and they're going to hit him with harder, more damaging punches as he comes in, you know, he reminded me a little bit of a kid that I really like. I, I, I mean, you can't not like this kid. He's so tough, and, and he makes nothing but TV-friendly fights. But he got hit too much. He never stopped punching. Um, and I was worried about and still concerned about his, his health in the future, fighting the kind of style fight that he fights. But hey, it won him, it won him two world titles. Um... The guy I'm talking about that Pedraza reminds me of a little bit is Brandon Figueroa, the former bantamweight, featherweight champion. Um, He's only 26 years old. Like I said, he throws a million punches. He's there, too, to get hit. He's relentless, too. Um, But I saw Figueroa improve a little bit, and I think Figueroa is better. You know, now, now, Cepeda still has a chance to get there. Um... He still has a chance to get there. They mentioned they mentioned afterwards, you know, DeLoy and all of them, I guess. They mentioned Haney um, potentially, right, as maybe next. I'll tell you one thing. That, that ain't no Christmas gift. Um, that's kind of like coal in the stockings for me. But it could be worse. It could be Tank Davis, who punches harder than Haney and... I believe, at least right now, that he would knock out Cepeda. Now, I believe that Haney's going to pick him apart and eventually stop him. Uh, again, I'm not trying to knock anyone. I'm, I'm telling what I, what I see, what my judgment is and tells me uh, for the fans out there. That's just my opinion. But Cepeda's a, a fun guy to watch. Um I just think that once he steps up, maybe the party's going to be over. I, I don't know. 
Uh, when you're predictable, you know, and you don't have much head movement, and you're always coming straight in uh, with no real power, he, you know, he's going to have some problems when he gets to that, you know, when he gets to that next level. But that's, that is my, uh, my honest, you know, opinion of, of, of him and, and his potential future. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a very thorough breakdown of a lot of fights that I know a lot of people, uh, didn't watch. So hopefully everyone appreciated that thorough breakdown. You can hear my dog barking over there. Yeah, she obviously yeah. Enjoy, yeah. she obviously enjoyed it. Would you feed that? Would you feed that <laughs> poor dog, please? Get, come on, and and, and oh, not man. now. Listen, I know it's it could work for dogs too, but not athletic greens. Give give him, give that dog. It's a girl, you said, right? Yeah. yeah. So give give her. You know, give her a nice steak. Come on, Ken. <laughs> if anybody's got steaks in the refrigerator, I know <laughs> that you have a few. Give, give her a nice steak, will oh you, Ken? God. And, all right. And save the <laughs> athletic greens for you, the the marathon runner, the guy that needs to keep slim and trim, which you're doing a great job of, a I'm great trying. job of. Actually, you want to hear a funny one? Uh, this weekend, my friend Todd Anderson had a birthday party, and he said he was having a home run derby at um, the Sound Stadium, First Horizon Park in downtown Nashville. It's like a double-A AA or triple-A baseball stadium, but a beautiful stadium, and sure enough, that's what they did. That's what they did. So I brought the kids. Man, it was so much fun to see the kids running around on, like, you know, obviously not a major league field, but the equivalent of the field itself was the quality was unbelievable. And we, uh, they took bat and practice. You know, of course, Cameron got hit with a line drive in the chest that almost killed him, but he went right back in there oh, on the next, yeah. on the next He's pitch. A tough kid. Oh, so much fun. It was like one of the most fun family events that we've ever done. Everyone had a blast. You know, all the guys were hitting bat and practice and the kids were fielding fly balls and Shelby was out there. And, you know, I've got a middle age, a middle school age daughter who just turned 13. So she was sitting watching most of it. And I went over and asked her, how you doing? She's like, mom's the only one, the only woman out there. I said, there were other women were sitting down. I said, mom's out there playing. But the point is middle school age, girls, 13, 14. Everything embarrasses her. I'm like, let me get it straight. You're embarrassed because your mom is fielding fly balls out there. She's a good athlete. And she looked great. Ken, 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 <laughs> there's a term for that. Teenager. Yeah, oh, my Teen God. Teenager. Oh. Welcome to that world. Teddy, it was so I hope hard. you enjoy it. I'm telling uh, you. I hope you love it. It is I've so I've been hard. there, done that. I it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, I'm like, but she's, she's like, beautiful. The, your daughter is the greatest. <laughs> she's beautiful. She's smart. She's brilliant. She's everything. But she's a teenager. Oh, my God. Teddy. She's a teenager. You know, when she's doing this thing, like, Dad, when you pick me up from lacrosse, can you just wait over there? I said, if you try to subliminally tell me not to let you see, I'll come and stand there on the sidelines. Don't have, yeah. I know what you're doing. I said, yeah. I, I guess I'm like the uncool dad. It's so shocking when it happens to you. That doesn't make you Columbo that you know what she's doing. I mean, uh, I mean, yeah. I'm laughing with uh, the fact that she doesn't think that I'm going to recognize what she's doing. But anyway, I digress. Before we go, I want to get your thoughts on a big heavyweight fight. Well, I say big because both of the guys are big. But Joe Joyce fighting the uh, Chinese heavyweight, Wei Li Is this... Is, Zeli Zhang, I always get his first name wrong. I confuse him with the Chinese uh, female UFC fighter, Wei Li Zhang. But Zeli Li Zhang and uh, Joe Joyce getting it on. This one's uh, close to even for the people at my bookie. We'll get into the prediction, but I just want to read the line to you because it's rare that we see a heavyweight fight where the line is so tight. We got Zhang at minus 123, Joe Joyce minus 112, and the over-under 10 and a half rounds. Under minus 26, over minus 108. That's as close to even as a fight gets. Um, this is an intriguing fight. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. The heavyweights, you know, these these are two of the better heavyweights. So what are you thinking here? What are you looking for? Who do you like? Et cetera, et cetera. Well, first of all, um, it's a rematch. And in the first fight, I tell you, they really sell. Well, it's at Wembley, right? Yep. Um Boy, they sell. Boy, those. I, when I die, I, I said it before, I said it again. I want to come back as a British promoter. Really. <laughs> because, really, they, those fans over there, I love you. My brothers and sisters across the pond. You guys are the greatest. And you make promoters rich because you come out for every darn fight. 
uh, your guys. You you back your guys. You back your guys, and it's great. It's brilliant. Here's the first thing that catches you that since you brought up the lines. I don't know if you have it in front of you, but I I know the neighborhood because my son told me. In the first fight, Joyce was like minus twelve hundred. Or maybe it was even more. Yeah. And Joyce was plus 600. So, wow, how far they've come <laughs> or how far they've dropped. Because what a change, what a turnaround. You need to start there to know Zang, the first, they gave him no chance. You talk about changing your position in life. I mean, you. this was like the movie with the great Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd changing places. I mean, it's like that movie. I mean, Zhang just changed places with Joyce. Joyce was the huge favorite. Joyce was the guy, you know, everybody was getting ready for the world title fight. Back in, you know, silver medalist from the Olympics. Actually, both guys are silver medalists from Olympics. They both are. Uh, but Joyce was the guy going to make all the big money over there in London, everything else. And Zhang, Zhang them. He Zhang them. He, he put himself in his position now. Now he's got to do it one more time. <laughs> Zhang stopped Joyce in the first fight. Uh, he closed his eye. The referee stopped it. He, he was winning the fight big, punching the heck out of him. Joyce is not hard to find, you know, really not hard. You turn the lights out and you still hit them. You could put them in a dark room and you still hit them. I mean, uh, you know, the late, great Mickey Duff. And see, when people have great sayings, if they're mine, they're mine. But when other people have them, I credit them. I don't make believe they're mine. Anyway, I, I, I digress. It's a great Mickey Duff, one of the great boxing people ever, ever. Great promoters, ever. Great boxing minds, ever. And he's from across the pond. Um, as he used to say, Joyce gets insulted if you miss him. Uh, or another great saying he had, Teddy, it's harder to miss this guy than it is to hit him. So Joyce gets hit a lot. I guess you get the point. Joyce gets hit a lot. And as I got close, they stopped the fight. What I want to say is, in breaking this down for the fans who want to bet on it or think about bet or just want to enjoy it more by understanding more about the two fighters, whatever. And if you're going to my bookie, you're not going to my bookie. Like I said, you're just going to get a cold one. You're going to sit back. You're going to enjoy the fights. I want to give you as much help as possible, as much info as possible to handicap the fight in, in your mind of who you think and why they should win. Joyce, Zhang is 40 years old. Joyce is 37, 38. But Joyce has more miles on the odometer. I always say you don't judge somebody's age in boxing chronologically. You judge it by the amount of punches they've taken, the amount of punishment that they've taken. And in that way, Joyce is the older fighter here. You just can't get hit that much. I know he has an iron chin. And I know that he was catching up to, to everybody. Parker, you know, some, some decent fighters. Uh, he was catching up to everybody. And he could punch even though he's slow, even though he's cement-footed, he's predictable. He had a great chin, great heart, and, and he could punch... And when he finally got to you, up until the Zhang fight, he usually got rid of you. But he took a lot of punishment to get there. And that punishment has a toll. It, it, it has a toll. And I think it's taken its toll. He looked like a shot fighter in his last fight. Now look, there can always be mitigating circumstances. I'm not there. I'm not in his camp. Maybe he got sick. Really? Maybe maybe something happened where he didn't have a good camp mitigating circumstances. Maybe. Maybe. And if that's the case, 
Maybe he wins this time. But without having that information to explain why he looks so horrendous, other than the fact that he never got taught right to actually elude a punch rather than eat a punch. Nobody ever really, he never had a teacher in his life in a boxing world to teach him what they should have taught him. And it might be too late now. But if he's that same guy who's going to rely just on being tough, just on weathering the storm, just on walking through punches, and finally landing a big one, if he's going to, if that's it, A, I think he's probably less than he was the last time because every time you get in that ring and you take punishment, you leave the ring with less of yourself. So he might even be less. Unless, again, he was sick, so he had the flu. There, there's some explanation for why he did, he looked as bad as he did. But that aside, could he land a punch on Zhang's chin? Yeah. I remember Zhang uh, getting, you know, I've seen him get hurt before uh, in fights. But Zhang has one loss, one draw. He His one loss, I thought he could have got the decision. I really thought he won. It was to the guy Hervoff. What do you, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but he's highly rated. Her, her, Hergov? Hergov? H. Oh, Hergovich? Uh, yeah, if that's, that's how it, you Hergovich. pronounce it. The heavyweight, he, uh, the Croatian? Yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah, very, very highly rated. Undefeated. I don't think that much of him, to be honest, but highly rated. And Zhang lost the, a decision to him, which, I, like I said, I thought he should have got it. And he also has a draw. But at the end of the day, for those out there that want to hear my pick, how could I not, after breaking it down thoroughly the way I did, how could I not go with Zhang again? If anything, he got more confidence after winning the first time. And unless he gets really careless, he's a big, big guy. He uses his height pretty well. You know, he's not impossible to hit either. But unless, you know, Joyce is a lot better than he was last time and a lot more invigorated, replenished, because he looked like a shot guy. So unless that happens and Joyce can get close enough to land two or three on the chin, that big chin, that tall chin of Zhang, I'm, I'm going with Zhang again. I don't know if he'll stop him again. He stopped him by closing his eye last time. I don't know that if he'll do that again. But just with his jab, just with his reach, just with his size that he knows how to use fairly well. I mean, he's not going to make you forget any of the heavyweight greats, Zhang. You know, he ain't making you forget, you know, uh, Joe Lewis or Ali or anything. But he's a big guy. You know, like a Primo Canero, uh, who was a heavyweight champ for a few minutes back in the 30s, 40s, whatever. Max Bear, but Max Bear could punch like hell with the right hand. But Max Bear was a big sort of lumbering guy, if you will, a little bit. Um, but Zhang actually looks like Fred Astaire, even though he's not a guy quick on his feet. But he looks like Fred Astaire compared to Joyce. I mean, jo Joyce is is that big bear that just, you know, comes there kind of like Muhammad Ali when he was making fun of, uh, uh, what was it, Sonny List. And he made fun of everybody, all his opponents. He gave them all nicknames. And he promoted, he was the greatest promoter ever, you know. And he would, he would give them nicknames, you know. He gave Floyd Patterson a rabbit. Uh, he gave Sonny List a bear. He gave George Foreman, I think it was, the mummy. Who who did he name the mummy? But when when he used to, I don't when he that used one. to say, yeah, when he used to say what to look forward to, like if if he was fighting the bear or the mummy, he would say, he's gonna come in like this. Ooh, 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 ooh. How's a guy like that gonna hit me? How's a guy like that gonna beat me? And um. Joyce, if Ali was around, 
uh, Joyce was around with Ali, Ali would have caught him one of those. Uh, whether it was the mummy or would have made a new one, the zombie, whatever. But he would have been saying it for those reasons. Joyce is slow on his feet, um, you know, cement footed. Uh, you know, he's just, uh, he's a guy that drags his feet, comes at you slowly, but he's a tough guy. He's a big guy. He's always been a good puncher. Always had a great chin. I don't know what's left of him, but we'll find out. We'll find out. It should be interesting. Yeah. It should be interesting. Yeah, uh, I agree. I, I, just, I just worry about guys like Joyce that get hit that much for so long, so long, so long. Uh, like, what happens later? You know what I mean? Like, what happens when they're not boxing no more five years down the road? But um, anyway, uh, not everybody can be a Floyd Mayweather. Not everybody. Can. <laughs> and I'm not saying you have to be. I'm not saying you have to be. But teach these guys some basic art of defense. You know, like move your head exactly. every once in a while. Yep. When I was in the ring, still boxing, right? And I was up there with the great custom model before I made my transition uh, into being a trainer. And I was boxing. I remember Cus when he would get mad at me. Um, he would he would yell in the ring if I was getting hit that particular day. He he would yell in the ring, "Hey Atlas, I don't know if anybody's told you, but it's not against the law to move your head." <laughs> <laughs> Funny, you just okay. you just gave me okay. you just gave me flashbacks to being in uh, in the camp with. Uh, Alex Vosdick when uh, Jim Killich was getting lit up and I said, move your head. <laughs> I don't know what you said. Uh, hey, uh, Angelo Dundee, no more coaching. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I probably said that. Probably. <laughs> not that you not that you were wrong. I mean, <laughs> not oh that my you God. were wrong. Yeah, well, that's for the people at MyBookie. Please, if you're going to bet on the fight, please go to MyBookie.ag and use the promo code ATLAS, A-T-L-A-S, for a 50% credit on your first deposit. Like I said, bet responsibly, but if you are going to bet, please support the show. Go to MyBookie.ag and use the promo code ATLAS. Teddy, that's a pretty thorough breakdown here. We covered every single fight under the sun this weekend. We gave a preview of the Joyce Yang fight. We got Tyson Fury's manager to basically come in and break big news. Usyk, Fury most likely happening before Christmas. That's a thorough day. That's a good show for a slow weekend. Nah, tremendous. I hope the people appreciate it. I hope they like it. We appreciate you. Hope you appreciate this. Um, you Please keep subscribing. Please put out your thoughts, um, your comments, uh, DVR, uh, if you're not there to see it, or do something like that, or tape it, or see it again, or go to the archive, whatever the hell it is, but subscribe, because we're at 297,000 subscribers now, I want to get to 300,000 like this weekend, really. This weekend, I want to get to three. That's three thousand. I want to get to three hundred thousand this weekend, and then I want to keep that march, like like you know that like MacArthur, you know. I, I want to keep that march straight towards one million. That's yes. right. I said it. I said it. And for any of the fans that are out there listening, if you're interested in coming to uh, spend an evening uh, dining with Teddy and I, you can join us on November sixteenth in staten island at the annual dr atlas foundation dinner we'll be there with a uh, incredible list of celebrity guests and attendees it's the dr atlas foundation dinner on november 16th in new york come meet the producer to the stars rob moore sam rivera myself and teddy plus a whole host of other um boxing celebrities boxing royalty basically uh, we've had everyone there tracy morgan uh evander holyfield the list goes on we'll be here all day if i list everyone but there's some great people that will be there george foreman sugar ray Leonard. yeah i mean if you know i mean dustin poirier last year what mm -hmm. a what a great appearance that was for people yep. what a great thrill and oh everyone's God, accessible you can come and talk to everyone there's no uh vip section it's um you know this is about the people and the sport of boxing and bringing everyone together so teddy you got anything else before we say goodbye we did we covered a lot here 
No, just um, go and give a big hug to that teenager daughter of yours, please. <laughs> I definitely please. will. And all tell right. her that I say hello. I definitely will. Um, all right. Well, guys, thanks for being with us. Please, like Teddy said, please subscribe to the show on YouTube. It's a huge help. And we'll be back with you next week to cover all the action once again. Have a great week, everyone.